Welcome to the Music Life podcast from the BBC World Service. I'm Meryl Garbus. I am one half of Tune Yards, a band which we started, I started as a solo project in the mid 2000s and now share with my husband and collaborator, Nate Brenner. I'm here in Oakland, California, where we make music and also do film scoring and other projects that are bringing us into life as musicians in this new decade. Music Life is a show where four artists from around the world get together to discuss all aspects of a life in music. A new podcast episode is released every Friday ahead of being broadcast on the World Service on Saturdays and Sundays, so subscribe wherever you get your podcasts to be sure not to miss any. You can also find loads of other great episodes at the website featuring the likes of Melanie C., Moonchild Sinelli, Hans Zimmer, Jenny Beth, Kem Petrus, Karun, Nick Hakim, plus lots of playlists compiled by some of the most exciting musicians working today. Head to bbcworldservice.com forward slash music life. Today I'm joined by Eric Burton of Black Pumas, Bardo Martinez of Chicano Batman, and Himes, Danielle, and Esti Heim. We'll be talking about whether or not we think about the audience when creating music, and how we reference the past while still being contemporary. So let's begin. I sh- maybe should have stayed in Canada and and somehow convinced Nate that it, the cold would be okay. <laughs> Our really? love would keep us warm. Why does that remind Is me it... of like a Joni Mitchell song? Yeah. <laughs> there's a song called California that yes. talks about in that, California. Just that very, right. that very idea. I'm a right. rock and roll band. What was that? I'm yeah. your biggest fan. I'm your biggest fan. <laughs> I mean, we could we could make this we could make this podcast simply about Joni Mitchell, and it would last a good twelve hours. Eric, how how's the mic? Did you get it? Did you? I think so. Can you still hear me? It's it's like when the the parents like, okay, kids, you guys, you have fun. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, here we go. How many songs have you written in quarantine? Bardo. I'm writing songs for my kids. Mm. Like just, you know. Oh, wow. It's, it's just easier that way. Can you give us an example? An example. Uh, Ooh, Esty, putting I, everyone on the spot. I'm, I'm uh, putting everyone on the spot. <laughs> I aspire one day to be a mom as well and write songs for my kids also. So, and I, I feel like I write them all day. I feel like kids' music is very like everything's about the object. So it's like I put it in the blender. Blender, put it in the blender, <laughs> blender, but first I'm going to chop it, chop it, but first I'm going to chop, like, you know what I mean? Right, right. Sounds like you got, you got yourself an album. I exactly. But I'm sure your children's music is probably much more elevated than what the example that I just gave you. So that's why I was curious. Uh, I mean, not really. <laughs> okay. I mean, I would, I would only be able to like sing the first line of it, but, uh, so yeah. The little, the little llama came to me and we began to talk about the things we began to do. The little llama came to me and we began to walk. <laughs> oh, I like that. It's not, it's not, that was the wrong lyrics. Well, if I had the booklet in front of me, I would, yeah, if I had the lyrics in front of me, but, uh, you know, you oh, call me out and I'm just, just busting no, on the spot. I know, I'm sorry. This is I have good. A, it's all good. I have a tendency to do that. Oh, I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry that I just bullied you. That was my bad. I'm sorry. In the spirit of fun. <laughs> okay. I can't wait for that Chicano Batman <laughs> next album. <laughs> um, Eric, how many songs have you written in quarantine? Um, I don't know. To be honest, I've just, I've kind of been tinkering around with a lot of um, voice memos and whatever I could... Uh, get my band to stay for during like a sound check or something like that. We were just overseas before all this. To be honest, I don't know that I've finished any songs, but I probably started 20 wow. or something like that. that. Yeah, That sounds promising, at least. Prolific, like, if anything. 20 starts. 20 yeah. starts is a huge start. <laughs> Thank you. And hi, I'm Gals. I, don't, I actually don't know when we'll get into this, but but who do you write songs together? Do you uh, write songs separately? How many songs between you? We start songs together, but I was going to say, including the songs that I make up in my kitchen for my about your blender. Yeah, about my blender. Then I, I mean, I have over 100. Uh, I, I <laughs> no. would say we're more on like the five song tip for sure. Yeah. 
Wow. I found it a little difficult to be creative in this time. Um, I think that it's been, I think like uh, Eric, I we, there's like starts of, of songs, but I find it hard to finish them mm-hmm. at this time. Right. I mean, part of what I have written zero. So I'm just here to say that <laughs> I've written zero. Yeah, that's I've okay done too. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're listening to the BBC World Service, and this is Music Life. I'm Meryl Garbus, one half of Tune Yards. I'm joined by one half of Black Pumas, Eric Burton, vocalist Chicano Batman, Bardo Martinez, and two thirds of the rock group Haim, Danielle, and Esty Haim. Part of what I wanted to ask you all is how is how much you think of audience, and and I'm not saying literal audience, but but the people that you're writing for when you are writing, and and particularly in this time thinking about writing for what people are experiencing right now, but how much, how much, if at all, do you think about who's listening when you start writing? Bardo. I was thinking about that this morning. I'm just coming up with songs. Like this morning I was writing about like some song about like the first day of fall. We have a newborn. He's uh, six months in a, in a few oh, days. Congratulations. Thank you. And so, you know, I took him from, from his mom in the morning, put him down while my, while my, uh, you know, my first grader is on Zoom in, in her wow. bedroom doing school. And I was just, you know, mm. coming up with, with the, the track about the first day of, of fall, right? And, um, you know, I was thinking about my process in writing songs, which is, for the most part, very insular. Lately, it's just been super basic songs, like I was telling you, for, for the kids. Four chords, like just majors, mm-hmm. A flat major, you know, C and stuff. And so if you have this feeling that you're able to, to capture at this moment, mm there's a lot of people who can't tap into to, to much of anything, mm-hmm. you know? And to keep going on that, this last record, Invisible People, I mean, it feels like so much in there, when I was listening to it, felt really directed in terms of you're speaking to people. Do you consider who you're speaking to? Are you kind of channeling, catching a vibe and, and transmitting it to people? That's interesting that you say that, you know, reflecting on the music that I'm, just working on here at the house compared to the music that I did with, you know, with Chicano Batman, right? With three other guys, which are my band, my band members, right? It was like a project that we really spent a lot of time cultivating in the studio together. We would create tracks and use our studios to kind of like flesh out the songs. I feel like Invisible People for us was, we're not just like some throwback retro band. Like we got some heat, we got some fire, you know what I mean? <laughs> It was kind of like leaning on mm-hmm. like indie rock, hip hop aesthetics in, 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 in our heads, I guess, or in my head as a songwriter, once it came down to like, who am I going to be during this song, mm-hmm. you know, taking up different characters right. in, in different songs. Julian Casablanca was a big inspiration for me and a lot of the writing for Invisible People and, and just making sure there was a vibe behind every lyric. Danielle and Essie, audience. Oh, how do you think, if do you think of who's listening when you start writing? I don't think we're really thinking about an, like an audience necessarily. I think we're just trying to conjure up um, inspiration when we're writing songs. I mean, my favorite moments are those moments where like a melody or something just kind of strikes you. And it's like, wow, this is a, this is, the, this is a cool idea, you know, but for us, we really have to work at songwriting. We have to show up somewhere every day and just attack it in a way, Mm -hmm. you know, just try to come up with something. And, you know, when we're, yeah, it's really like a muscle that we have to flex when we write songs. Mm -hmm. We have to kind of, yeah, like I said, show up every day and just kind of try and write something and try not to put too much pressure on something. Right, right. When the audience, the thought of there being an audience might actually hinder the songwriting. (laughs) Totally, 100%, 100%. Well, I think Mm -hmm. especially on Women in Music Part 3, we kind of collectively all realized that we were individually running away from different things and they'd finally kind of caught up to us. And I think that that was kind of the impetus for us wanting to, to write about it was our personal experience and how we were dealing with chronic illness and the death of a, of a friend or just kind of being on the road in general and not really feeling like you may or may not have a place 
in your friend group anymore or in your family anymore, even though we are family. Mm -hmm. There were times when it was kind of hard to come back and like relate to people that we were related to. Mm -hmm. I think for us, it was more about, it was like group therapy. Meeting on a lawn, it would crack open our respective journals. We have diary entries on one side of the page and then we write lyrics on the other side so we can just write like read the diaries <laughs> on one side and then read the lyrics on the other side so smart so it's our weird organizational way of keeping things together we had a lot that we wanted to talk to each other about and open up about and it ended up coming out in the music and there were definitely some things that we saved for our therapists we decided that we can't just be like willy-nilly like every like anything goes there were definitely times where we were like i really think this is something for doctor what's his face not for the internet yeah not for the internet or like not even for like the relationship between the three of us i think that there were some things that we realized mm -hmm. that we needed to kind of just not talk about with one another because we collectively were you know we wear each other's emotions i think all three of us are like empaths and if Danielle is spiraling about something I end up spiraling with her and the same goes for Alana and you know we love each other so much and we're so close that like when any of us is kind of going through something I think that we all kind of end up feeling that same feeling and it, almost experiencing that same experience. Eric what about for you I, I, and I mean it's, it's interesting also hearing the difference between writing collaboratively, let's say, and what Bardo was saying about kind of the vibe, the vibe between band members and, and that, but um, do you write your, your lyrics solo mostly? Yeah, I, I, I couldn't get Adrian to write lyrics with me to save my <laughs> life. It's just the production style, maybe on my side, I might have a few notes. And on his side, for the most part, I write fairly well under pressure. So I feel just kind of being in the studio and you know, I'll have Adrian point out like, oh, that's cool. Like, why don't you run with that? And it's very much abstract in the way that we, you know, work together ourselves, that it is just feels really organic uh, to speak to what um, Bardo was saying. We ride the wave and I get so crazy in the studio. I'm like, when I first went to the studio, I feel like I, I kind of, I probably scared Adrian <laughs> because if something's happening that's really exciting, I'm, I'm going to let people know. I'm going to let everyone in the studio know. I go, whoa! <laughs> like, I love... I get really excited. And, and as far as um, what D&E we're speaking to, our pain and joy that we feel as just, in, you know, as human beings, you know, it's not, uh, it's not separate from the next person. And so I feel like the things that are happening around the world, we're all kind of feeling it in this sort of ripple effect kind of way that... You know, I guess if you can just sit and be honest with yourself, whatever comes from your heart is, you know, inevitably going to touch someone else's. So that's generally how I take to the mm -hmm. writing process. I mean, considering all of your work, how it's giving me faith. <laughs> you know, I might reflect on Thank you. a little bit on who might be listening, but if I do it too much, I'm, it's gone. The, the, creative, the creative spark is gone. You know, for me, what's dangerous about that is my experience is often really complex. And so I might speak to this thing A and this thing B that are kind of contradictory, but they have to live in a song together because the song wanted those things to live together. When I first started songwriting, nobody was listening. Or, you know, Eric, like you, I was a busker. I was on the street. I was in subways, you know, in Montreal with my ukulele trying to scream over trains. Mm -hmm. I didn't think about how, you know, someone picking apart my lyrics because <laughs> they could barely hear them. Mm -hmm. I mean, Eric, especially for you, because this is an extreme debut album. You know, this is, this is <laughs> to have your first album be oh, so, so lauded and therefore exposed. I wonder about going into kind of how our songwriting processes have changed now that we have bigger audiences. Do you feel that changing for you? Yeah, I guess uh, I've always kind of uh, felt like somewhat of the uh, underdog that part of the madness that's going on it really fuels me and, you know, and is very scary at the same time. You know, I, you know, getting back from tour um, one run and having like a really intimate phone call, just kind of walking around my neighborhood and, you know, it's kind of like the first time people were like really like noticing me in town, like, oh, hey, Black Pumas. No, it just really, 
jolted me a bit because that just doesn't happen to people. You know, I've always kind of been popular, but 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 not t to this degree. I don't think about how many people are watching the YouTube, you know, streams or Spotify until lovely people such as yourself bring it up and I'm like, <laughs> "Oh yeah, there's, you know, this is this is really like really blasting off. Like I'm very much engaged with the song writing process and just processing my own life and my own like for my own therapy that um I don't really know, you know, I don't really see what's going on until someone tells me or until I get stopped on the street where, you know, I would never have been before. Mm -hmm. Dreamers. We're in our dream, in our dream minds. <laughs> I'm, I don't need to be interviewed or talk to each other. Y'all probably know, know each other's work as well as I do. Musically, d and &E, what, what are you guys inspired by? I was just listening to some of your music on the way, my way home. Collectively, my family is, we're music obsessed to the yeah. point where like, I can remember being in the car with my dad and listening to Kareth 101. Everyone on this call should know what Kareth 101 uh -huh. is. So listening, I was four <laughs> and my dad singing, do you remember? <laughs> yep, singing totally. that. And then my dad at yeah. the chorus was like, you can't reach this note but I can. <laughs> Our dad's very intense. Oh, dad wow. is very so competitive. competitive, but he was like, can you do this? Ba, 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 ba. <laughs> Basically in competition with a four-year-old being like, you can't reach this note. My dad put us on the drums when we were two. I, I don't remember a time when I wasn't playing music or tinkering on an instrument and then oh, i yeah. think since i'm the oldest i talk over danielle all the time which i you've just seen well i think you hit the nail on the head Esty. we're all drummers our dad's a drummer and i would say drums is truly um the most inspiring instrument for us since we all that's the instrument that we started with and when we're writing songs a lot of the times we will start with drums mm -hmm. i play drums on all the albums it's so funny barter that you talked about julian casablancas because i feel like he's like a constant inspiration of ours and the strokes are too and i actually did some touring with julian and like two years before we got signed i was in his band so like he actually like very much i, I remember going informed you know i remember going to him and asking him like hey like i'm in a band and he gave me some really great advice yeah his advice was actually like stop playing live because we were playing like so many, you know, opening for our friends a couple times a month and like nothing was happening. He's like, you need to get a good recording. And I was like, okay, good recording. <laughs> anyway, yeah. he, um, he really helped us. Um, he's such an amazing songwriter. I'm always thinking about how he writes songs. Um, yeah, he's a huge inspiration for us. Did you play in his solo project? Yeah, I was, I was uh, in the 6-6. Six, six. Does that... I was like a percussionist and a guitarist on the, the first Julian Casablanca's tour. Wow. So really, it was his first solo album, yeah. It's funny because like my studio is kind of like inspired by like that album cover a little bit. Yeah, I see the red. <laughs> yeah, totally. Totally. It's so yeah. cool. He's so yeah. cool. Yeah. So do you... Danielle, do you start songs with drums generally? I mean, is that where most... A lot of the times. I mean, it's, it does, yeah. it's, it's, I don't, we don't really have a drum set up. Like it's not, it's usually not like live drums. It'll just be like programming some sort of drum beat or like BPM and, and just kind of working off that. A lot of the times we write songs, it's kind of starts like that. Um, I don't want to talk too much about genre and like, a, you know, how much do you, what, what's the genre of music do you say that you would, well, Brido, let me throw it to you because you kind of said something about like, in, you know, not just throwing it back to these historical, the music that you're coming out of. What's your relationship with, with the music that you are inspired by and how do you kind of keep it in, you know, I'm using, I'm making music for today versus I'm making a kind of throwback music. Um, you know, we've been a band for 10 years, so that complexity is even more complex because of the amount of time that we've been doing Chicano Batman. Sure. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so basically That's with right. Chicano Batman with the new record, we're like, you know, no, let's, let's get rid of that old box. Let's, let's mm -hmm. do some music where it's kind of like undefinable. And mm -hmm. we all agreed on that. I 
because I, I hear you all even choosing synthesizers, choosing like production elements that really are like, no, we're just, you know, oh, you think we're this? How about yeah. this? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. How about this wild card sound? Yeah, did exactly. that when you were in the studio, did that um, kind of desire to not be in somebody's box? Did that inform those choices? Yeah. I mean, we recorded Freedom is Free uh, with Leon Michaels in 2015. That was the, the record before the last one. And that was the first time that I've been in like a studio like that. And to be honest, it's very unique. I mean, you know, you have like two inch tape machine over here. You have all these weird boxes, you know, and I, I figured out what a learned what a preamp was, you know what I mean? Yes. So just learning what a studio is and you know, how everything functions. And once you start learning about those things, you start appreciating everything. You know, you you start listening to like Duran Duran or something and you're like, wow, these drums sound <laughs> so big, like, you know, and you start, you know, just going on that path of like being on um, uh, R starts with an R. Reverb? Yeah, I'm like I'm, a, mm. you know, being on reverb all day, looking up tape machines, like oh, looking yeah. up preamps yeah. all day. We've been there. Been there. It's just a whole different part of yourself, right? It's like, it's interesting. Like I'm, I'm also bringing this up and I'm curious how you have all developed these different characters. Like I'm like 20 different characters, mm -hmm. you know? I have a producer mindset. I have a songwriter mindset. I have a... You're yeah. multifaceted. Yeah. But yeah. You've got a lot of different sides. Yeah. How do we find things that, that kind of generate, uh, surprise us or jolt us out of our habits? I guess the whole the whole thing was, you know, Eric, you were talking about the studio being... I'm like that too, bro. I'm up in the studio. I'm like, everybody's going to know I'm there. You know what I'm saying? Like, yo, stop the tape. <laughs> record it record it when you play the tape like we got to get that you got to get yeah. that yeah it's just so exciting like being in the studio and just all the toys and whatnot i'll say that for for <laughs> sure you know the studio we, we worked at barefoot studios in uh in hollywood for the last record such a great place yeah. and uh we had a blast there see you guys like the studio i <laughs> The studio is, so, I have such a love-hate relationship with the studio. Danielle loves the studio. Danielle co-produced women, like all of our records, but took a very, very, very much of a, a driver's seat situation with Women in Music Part 3. I, I love the craft of songwriting. Writing lyrics and writing melodies is therapeutic, and, and I, I love it. However, being in the studio and playing the same bass line 700 times times and never feeling like I'm getting it is <laughs> very hard for my mental health. So I personally I feel you. think all of us are perfectionists. I'm sure everyone on this call is a perfectionist mm -hmm. to a fault. The thing that I love about playing live is that I get on stage. If I mess up, it was a moment. It happened. It was in front of an audience. And you know what? I loved it. I messed up. Big deal. It happened. It's a moment in time and, yeah. and then I move on to the next performance. And I think that that's the thing that's hard for me in the studio. I think Danielle uh, loves being kind of a mad scientist in the studio and twisting knobs and connecting wires. And it just makes me angry when I can't get something exactly like right or the way that mm -hmm. I'm hearing it in my head or the way like like when I'm playing the bass and I feel like my tone isn't right and for me my tone doesn't come from the box the tone comes from my left and right hand if I'm not mm -hmm. sounding right it bums me out and I get really really down on myself yeah. and I get really really hard on myself I have a very love hate I guess is mm -hmm. is the way to put it but you give me a drum set if if like that's I think the thing that Danielle and I and Alana are all drummers, but we don't play drums in our band. <laughs> <laughs> like we play drums only. So, I mean, we have drum sets on stage, but we that are that are just kind of for us to jam on stage with. But like, none of us play like the, an actual set in our show. Which we should also talk about Danielle. We should sidebar and like maybe mm -hmm. try and sidebar and figure that <laughs> out. Drums are such a fun instrument that i truly feel like we all kind of let go on and i played i was a um a percussion ethnomusicology major with an emphasis in percussion in college so i was playing gamelan and you know brazilian percussion and fundu and macasson and 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 also singing in the bulgarian women's choir for fun <laughs> thanks so much to my guests eric burton bardo martinez danielle and sd Heim. 
And thank you for listening. I'm Meryl Garbus. Um, head to the website for more Music Life shows, bbcworldservice.com forward slash music life. Thank yeah. you, guys. Peace, fam. I want to know so thank much more. It's like a teaser. <laughs>